So here we go. This is Entropy to Work. I am your guest, Thiago Ebel. Welcome. Uh, again, jumping straight to the topic, and at the end, I'll add more comments. I have some comments now in the beginning. Uh, today, we're talking about refrigeration and HVAC, that it stands for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Uh, an application that I've been in and out my professional life for a while now. So I'm just going to, I think no one gets ever offended for going back to the basics. So I'm going to go to the basics for the next minute or two, just to clarify some points that I think might be useful. Okay. So AC, air conditioning, is a system that controls humidity, ventilation, and temperature, meaning refrigeration and heating is inside it, but it is broader than that. Okay. And refrigeration itself is the act of removing heat from one space and putting it somewhere else. So in order to cool a space, you would remove the heat from there. Okay. Uh, in an analogy for someone who doesn't work with this or is not technical, I guess a good analogy that I can think that I, I did use in the past, not sure it's going to work, but basically imagine you have a, a wet surface, okay, with water and you have a sponge to dry that you would put that sponge in and soak it, right? And then you take that sponge somewhere else and you squeeze it to take the water out. And then you keep repeating this process until you dry the place, okay? This will be the equivalent of what a refrigeration system does when the water is the heat and the sponge is the working fluid. And you would be the work that you need to put in there in order to remove the heat from one space to the other. Now, I'm using this analogy because it's easy to understand that some sponges are better than others. So you have larger sponges, you have sponges that can absorb a lot of water at once. And it's the same with these working fluids. Basically, some are better than the others. And in this approach of developing refrigeration systems, back some years ago, not that long ago, we used to use CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons. And it was a great um, sponge for refrigeration systems, but not for something else. That is the depletion of the ozone layer. If you're my age or older, you know, in the 90s, you would remember that was the big thing, the ozone depletion layer, the depletion of the ozone layer, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, I just thought about including that. So CFC stands for chlorofluorocarbons. That is one kind of uh, working fluid. And later that was replaced by HFC, so hydrofluorocarbons, and uh, I had a couple of problem, a couple of times pronouncing that during the podcast. So now we go. Now actually jumping to it. Today I'm talking to Trevor Matthews from Emerson. He has been deeply involved into developing and training industry professionals over the last six years at Emerson, and he has over 15 years of experience working with refrigeration. And um, he's a licensed refrigeration and air conditioning mechanic. In our talk, we talk about the refrigeration market, new fluids coming up, challenges, and the many opportunities in the refrigeration and HVAC world. Trevor's a fun guy. He also lived in Australia offline, and then a little bit at the end of the podcast, we talked about it. We both lived in Perth, Western Australia for some time. And uh, this talk really opened my eyes for a lot of stuff that I really didn't know, like how much of... Uh, of actually using CO2 as a working fluid is already in the in the field. A lot of uh, a lot of refrigeration systems are already using it, and uh, a whole world of HVAC influencers helping out people to know how to deal with with this new technology. So yeah, that's pretty interesting. I really enjoyed this talk. So now I bring you Trevor Matthews. <laughs> We go and we are live Trevor thank you for being awesome. here Tiago thank you for having me so you're the first person that I'm of meeting because of the podcast so I'm I'm excited <laughs> I'm really excited too and thank you for having me on <laughs> cool so uh let's first things first so who are you what well, tell us a little bit about your background on HVAC and how you end up in this industry how you end up at Emerson and being what is your position again? Director of uh, um, uh, the HVAC and refrigeration training and development specialist for Emerson, Canada. Fancy name. Yeah, so, 
Yeah, it's a very fancy name. Um, <laughs> so a bit of my background, I uh, started in the field. I was a technician for many, many years in different sides of the industry. So supermarket refrigeration, commercial refrigeration, then I got into the air conditioning side and gas fitting side. So lots of different licensing and um, certificates across the country. I also traveled abroad, so I went out to Australia to work out there for a year to get some uh, some experience as well as to enjoy the sun. <laughs> then uh, came back to Canada, worked more in the commercial um, refrigeration industry, so back into the supermarket world, and uh, ended up at Emerson back in 2014, really when I had my first child, because as a refrigeration mechanic, you work crazy amount of hours, and it's a demanding job because if a client has a system down, you need to get that up and running, all right? Because you're talking about hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars of product. So you need yeah. to make sure that system's up and running. So back in 2014, I decided that uh, I didn't want to continue to work the 80, 100 hour a week. So I started looking for a job uh -huh. and this opportunity at Emerson where a new place I moved in Brantford, Ontario, uh, had a job opening and I applied for it. And uh, luckily enough, I got it. And I'm pretty happy that I did because I've over the last six years, I've learned so much about the refrigeration HVAC industry from Emerson. It's it's unbelievable. That's pretty cool. It's it must be pretty interesting being on that side of the fence first. So being the technician, being the guy using this product, and then now when you are on the other side, actually working for the OEM. Yeah, it 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 uh, was a huge game changer for me for sure. Seeing how to install it, uh, commission it and service the equipment and then really working with the engineering team now to talk about what I seen in the field that wasn't really working or could be improved. And really we have a great team here at Emerson on really understanding the customer pain points. And we here in Canada, at least we hire a lot of mechanics out of the field. So refrigeration mechanics specifically that worked in the field for a long time to bring that experience uh, to the company, which is real cool. That's really cool. Yeah, by following you and stalking a little bit, I, I realized like even being from this field a little bit, it's been a while I work in refrigeration, but and also now stalking a little bit, I realized there was this whole world of podcasts of of technicians and people with YouTube channels that I didn't even realize. That's really cool. I was listening to you to talk to some of the guys and what is the stuff that you've seen in the field. That's that's really cool. Yeah, so there's a a lot of influencers in this space, uh, which I'm really proud to know and uh, be in contact with because they're really trying to push the, the limits and the boundaries to help technicians out in the field because there is so much information out there, but it's hard to, to get to that information when you're working 10, 12, 14 hour days. And a lot of the times you just want to get home and kick back, right? So yeah, a lot so. of the influencers are doing it in the evenings, on the weekends, you know, on holidays, trying to get information out just to support the industry because there is there's a huge need to develop the industry today. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. That's cool. And well, that brings me to my to my first question. I'm not sure if you see that in your like your outside of your professional world when talking to family and friends. And people are just like, mm, refrigeration, mm, okay, kind of like my my fridge. I think a lot of people outside don't really realize how much there is to it. And first of all, they how important it is to, you know, it's not just making you comfortable in your room, but so much else actually relies on that and depends. Products that, you know, need and medicines, everything that would go bad if you don't have like 24-7 refrigeration system delivering that. Do you find that? And how do you explain that to people that are like, hey, actually your life depends a lot on refrigeration systems. Yeah, I don't tell anyone I'm a refrigeration mechanic. <laughs> no. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, um, to be honest, it, it is true. Even back, I started in industry 2004. I only learned about the industry back in 2004. Before mm -hmm. that, refrigeration, what was refrigeration? I didn't even know when I first took my first HVAC program, really what refrigeration is. I got into it because uh, of somebody I met on the street actually and told me a bit about it. And I asked him, what is refrigeration? Well, do you know when you go to your grocery store and you pick up milk, that needs to stay cool somehow. <laughs> so, and I'm like, oh, cause I never had air conditioning in my house when I was uh, younger. So I didn't really think of air conditioning or refrigeration mechanic as a trade. And we didn't have it in my school either. We didn't mm -hmm. have those types of trades where I was from. So I didn't know anything about it. And when I talked to friends and family about it, 
it's still depending on the what we're talking about. If you're talking about air, air conditioning in your house, it's uh, pretty basic. But when you start talking about large processing plants, pharmaceutical companies, you know, cooling data centers, things like that, because all the heat oh, yeah. that's generated off the service, it's, it can get a high level if you're not into, you know, if you don't understand it a bit more. But it's easy to explain at a high level. But when you start to dive deep into refrigeration and how it works, the thermodynamics of it, you can uh, lose some people. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've definitely been there before. Cool. With um, with all the time working and working a little, uh, some time abroad as well, what is your favorite thing in the in the in the industry, either technology or not? What do, what do you like so much about the refrigeration system? Well, so, some of the things. The, what I really like now is teaching, ed, educating people. I uh, over the last 14, 15 years, I've developed a lot of skills really no master at anything, but I really understand different systems, architectures of systems, and I really like sharing that knowledge. Right now, I'm on a, a massive, uh, I guess, confidence boost. On sh the more information I share and content I share, the better I feel. Like I yeah. said earlier, it's hard for people to find content. There's so much information on the internet. It's, it's really hard sometimes when you're looking for something. It's right in front of you, but it's sometimes hard. So I really like that point uh the, the point i am in my life where i can give back to other technicians engineers other manufacturers you know building equipment and i, I really like that I, I like that part and and really the refrigeration side that that's my background i love talking refrigeration i talk to all my buddies that are still mechanics and we can go on conversations for hours just talking about jobs and and, and different aspects of the industry which is a lot of fun that's pretty cool. And the, when you talk about being in the field and stuff like that, that's some questions that I have because I've met definitely technicians in the past that were able to design the whole refrigeration system themselves. You just would say, hey, I have a cold room here, needs to stay, needs to stay at five Celsius and uh, do everything else. But they, at least back in Brazil where I'm from, you always needed an engineer to sign that off, even though I met guys that would know their stuff really well they didn't they didn't need anyone else but just by regulamentation they would need an engineer to sign off do, is that the same in canada yeah you do on big architectural projects there is sign-offs that need to be done as well as esa so electrical sign off so there's a lot of different um things that you need some contractors do have that where they mm -hmm. will get the rights to be able to sign off certain things but you do need to have someone um, that can sign off certain pieces of equipment. And same here, I know some contractors that can build a system better than an engineer, but they still need to go to through the process, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cool. And, uh, and in this whole thing, what is your least favorite part? Where's the thing that you're just like, oh, man, this, this is part of the job, but it's just like, I'd really rather not deal with this. Um, the one, one of the things is, is, I kind of alluded to it, is not being able to reach as many people as I would like, hmm. to be honest, uh, because it, it's really hard. There's so many distractions today, and I see our industry, at least here in Canada, as well as North America, there's not really a huge influx of people wanting to do trades, or there's not a huge influx of people want to get into refrigeration and HVAC industry, even though you can make more money than a doctor, you know, depending on what section uh, and what industry you are because there's a lot of different job roles. You could be a chiller mechanic, a controls mechanic, a rack mechanic, an HVAC mechanic. There's so many different roles. And then you can move on like myself and, and build your career off that training. But I feel that's one thing that I don't like is that we're not doing enough to educate parents as well as um, children how advantage the, the advantages of having a skilled trade um, because you can make easily six figures doing yeah. uh, refrigeration, easy. Yeah, that's yeah. You bring up a big point. I think a lot of people talk about college and stuff like that, but sometimes like being hands-on and having a technician degree is just much, so much more valuable, and so much people are just born for that. That's just the reality. And, yeah, and they're exactly. Super successful doing that. Yeah, I, I, I did go to university. I went to college as well. And uh, at the end of it, I went back and took a trade because I knew the advantages of it uh, for me. And I found out the advantages. That actually, I jumped in and I didn't know all the 
how fun it was going to be. And it's not all fun and games it's like any job, you know, like I yeah, said, working absolutely. with 80, 100 hours a week, working split shifts, night shifts, mm -hmm. uh, you know, being away for three months at a time, building stores across the country. Wow. Uh, from That's family, crazy. You know, but if you want to be a master at something, and it doesn't matter if it's uh, refrigeration or anything, you got to spend the time and you got to be dedicated. And that's really what I felt like I did over the last uh, 10, 15 years. Yeah, that's uh, th that was one of the podcasts that I was hearing that you were part of. And you, you said something that was really cool that is like really put a skin on the game before, you know, going to the next step and start doing trainings and stuff. You, you really need to spend your time there and, you know, be on the trenches basically. and and do yeah. those hundred hours that you just mentioned and you know know what you meant when you okay i tried everything now it's a now i'm just stuck yeah. now I'm, yeah. I, I'm going to reach out for help or something like that yeah and and there's so much there's so many people in the industry that want to help and it doesn't matter where it's at in the world now because with the internet um we're a small mm -hmm. smaller community than ever before the world is smaller yes you mm -hmm. might be right now you're in i believe the uk you were telling me we're six yeah. hours difference apart, but there is now I, I deal with mechanics and technicians in Europe as well as Brazil or Australia, just trying to share the knowledge in this small community to engage other people to get excited about refrigeration and the HVAC industry, as well as share that knowledge to pass it down to generations. When I first got into the trade and I, I talked to older say senior guys or guys that were just about to retire they used to say that um, a lot of the mechanics and technicians would just save that knowledge and they wouldn't share it we're at a point right in the world that you the need to share as much as possible because it doesn't matter how much you share if you go on google you're going to find more information than you'll ever know about whatever mm -hmm. topic is and it doesn't matter who you are it's just there's so much information you've got billions of people putting data and information in there is it all right that you will read maybe not but it, there's just so much data and you can find it. Mm -hmm. It's how do you dissect that information that you're looking for and, and provide it to the people in the right way where they can understand it. Because mm -hmm. even refrigeration, it's not very difficult to understand when you want to learn it. And, you know, you're doing it for the right reason. It's like any, any job or any business. If you yeah. love what you're doing, you're going to learn more be better, get better, find coaches, find mentors, and really develop your skills to the best level. Yeah, the reality is when you get to that point in your career, there's actually no one to compete, but just people to collaborate because you all have your own expertise and you actually, you can just learn from other people and collaborate. That's just, that's just the best way to move forward. Yeah, well, the only way to learn more is to work with smarter people or people that know more than you. Yeah, and that's absolutely. what I suggest to anyone, especially if you're working at a, a company or you're a technician and you feel like you're standstill or you're not, uh, the people aren't sharing with you, you don't feel there's, there's another 50 companies out there that want people who are eager to learn. You know, it's always good to, you know, get that experienced guy to help out your business. But at the end of the day, if that person can't help share their knowledge, help develop the rest of the team, well, it might be a bit easier to get someone to, to, develop and get them mm -hmm. into that leadership role who wants to share teach the guys and once again it doesn't matter what industry you're in yeah you're absolutely right and you mentioned about so much information available but hard to find it what what do you think but because i see that in different industries actually what do you think might be a solution maybe an association of refrigeration or something like that how how you know if in an ideal world how would you solve that problem uh, first step, I, I think at this point, there's lots of great associations. I can list them all off, but find some influencers on the internet, on YouTube, huh. on Instagram, on TikTok, and find who you relate with. And then find, cool. see if the information that they're giving you is that you can comprehend. Mm -hmm. Because there are so many opportunities now. You can and, and definitely get into the different associations. There's lots globally that you can be involved in. But I, I really believe these there are a lot of influencers that are out there that are doing content for free all the time, trainings mm -hmm. for free all the time to try to help develop the skills of others. So that, that's mm -hmm. my suggestion. And then from there is learn how to do research, you know, on Google. And yeah. then the first thing you read is not always the, the thing you're looking for. So take time and learn how to research. That's one of the things that I spent the last four or five years here at Emerson is doing research. 
research and competition, research in our business models, research in the products that we've built and developed and try to understand how we've done it to this point and how we're going forward to make you know the world, our solutions a better better place, better product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, learning how to research definitely is a, it's a skill in itself. Just how to research properly is not just putting the right keywords on, on Google anymore. Cool. And uh, what do you now that you're working on the OEM side? I've, you know, myself, I also have been most of my life working for OEMs and people that actually develop the products. But when talking to technicians and honor field engineers, you just find out just a bunch of, you know, all of them would have some very strong feelings like, why would you put the drainage here? Like, it's impossible to do this. I need to tell it everything apart just to take this screw off. Like, why would you do that? So, do you see a lot of that? And now, being on the other side, can you, are you providing more insight to the people who yeah. are, you know, never in the field and just like, oh, I didn't think about that? Yeah, no, I, I see that a lot, even within our organization and other organizations. And it does happen uh, because you can come up and write stuff on the paper, you know, and you can document. And I've seen this. I've been in boardrooms for this drawing stuff up and it looks perfect on paper. But when you get it out to the field, it's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. I've seen this as well as being in construction side of refrigeration and then service side. So I worked on both sides. Mm -hmm. But the construction guys just don't didn't understand that putting that ball valve that where you need a 14 foot ladder to get up to shut off the liquid line for a case way down here where it should have been really down below where a guy doesn't need a 14 foot ladder to get to the ball valve in the ceiling you know so mm -hmm. it, it happens when you don't have that experience or you don't see that stuff because a lot mm -hmm. of the engineers and you got amazing engineers out there they really haven't if it's a new product especially they may not have seen that before and they're mm -hmm. trying to come up with ideas where they've never worked on stuff like that before. That's why mm -hmm. it's good to have a, a team, a variety of team with different experiences and different knowledges. So if you're building a team out there and you have engineers, you need to get engineers that are from different parts of engineering. People that did engineering for a certain section of the business and another engineer. And then you should have customers coming in and asking questions. Like that yeah. one, why is the drain there? Like, how do I access that drain? I have to take off 14 bolts to clean this drain every time, every service maintenance, right? Just things like that. And then, and then get different points of view before you put the stamp and sticker and it's in production <laughs> because mm -hmm. that definitely happens. Cool. And are you seeing that now inside Amazon where you order OEMs in the field? Like, do you believe now that's happening more or is it still like a lot of work to do? A collaborating? Lot? I yeah. think more and more now that if there's a lot more collaborating, I think more uh, manufacturers are listening to customers, Emerson, not only Emerson, but other ones getting understanding their pain points. Cause that's what Emerson's really good at is mm -hmm. listening to the customers and what their pain points are. If it's in the cold chain or if it's in human comfort solution, wherever it's at, what we do, we have people on the ground working with customers to try to develop the products they are looking for, which has been a huge shift probably over the last 20 to 30 years when manufacturing, where a lot of the manufacturing, and not only Emerson, was like, this is the product, it's the first of its kind, it's the best, you know, this is what you got to use. But now mm -hmm. as the world gets smaller and there's thousands of other competition, which I love, I love our competition because it makes us better. When I see <laughs> a competitor come out with a new compressor, a new valve, or a new control system, I love it. Because that mm -hmm. means we got to work harder, dig deeper, find out what we can provide for a customer that's going to be the best solution. Mm -hmm. Cool. In the both at Emerson in your experience before, how how is the day by day work like now? Not now that you are uh, let's say teaching people how to do it, but before let's say I am a customer, but I'm not your customer. I am your contractor's customer. So I am starting. I don't know. Um, I'm starting a, a petrol station and I have to, I want to have a beer cave there. And that beer cave needs to be 500 watts of cooling capacity and needs to stay at zero Celsius. What is the first step? Like, do they go to Emerson and Emerson would have like a off the shelf solution or do they, okay, let me make some calculations. I need my condenser to be this big and my evaporator to be this big. And in order to do that, well, I probably need a compressor that is this. So you go to the you know data sheet from Emerson and choose one. How how does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. 
So we are a solution and product manufacturer. So we build equipment for manufacturers to build that product for that example that you, you gave me. So we do build condensers, but really what we do is we would work with our manufacturers. So the manufacturers would have an engineering team would say exactly what you said. I need this many BTUs um, per water, whatnot and this is the size and this is the equipment we sell all the components but we don't really manufacture many components depending on where you are if we're talking about industrial uh, residential commercial because we play in all those spaces mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. would work with either the contractor and help the contractor find the right uh, manufacturer or the oem to build that equipment or we mm -hmm. would directly work with uh, the manufacturer who's working with the end users as well as we do work with consultants but once again we have we like to collaborate with our with our OEMs and our manufacturers as well as the contractors as well as engineering teams we try to bring everybody and make everyone involved to feel involved to bring that best solution for that end user because mm -hmm. at the end of the day usually that end user isn't working with the large manufacturer they're working with the contractor so we want to make sure everybody is in the loop and mm -hmm. uh, yeah we that's the way it usually works cool it's really cool Okay, nice. And what do you see in terms of trends, like stuff that was not common, let's say five or 10 years ago, and now it's like the norm or it's becoming the norm now. A couple of them that I remember when I was doing research, like compressor or variable speed, that was something really fancy and now kind of looks like it's becoming the norm. What else yeah. do you see? Is that correct? Do, do yeah, you no, see that's, more a, more of them? that's a great, great question. Like, so even since, when I started here in 2014, so much has changed in the last six years alone. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things that are driving it is regulations. Oh yeah. So when I started imagine. back in 2014, I learned about something called the F-gas regulation, which is a European refrigerant regulation that started, I believe, in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. We're at the point now where regulation is pushing the industry for more economical, more um, more environmentally friendly products. So right now, we've just went through multiple refrigeration changes, phase out and phase down through, depending on where you're at in the world, mm -hmm. through um, an amendment to the Montreal Protocol. So if you know what that is, back in 1987, the Montreal Protocol was to get uh, chlorine or CFCs out of the, um, the system, so because it was damaging the ozone layer. Mm -hmm. and now it's um, we're trying to get out uh, GWP global warming potential refrigerants. Mm -hmm. So F gas regulation was really pushing that. And since I found that out in 2014, when I started learning about the F gas regulation here in Canada alone, our regulations back in uh, 2020 all centralized rack. You can't use a refrigerant over 2200 GWP. Mm -hmm. which is like the 404, 507s, like 404, yeah. I believe is 3922. So you have to come up with another solution. So all these chemical manufacturers have been coming out with newer refrigerants. Mm -hmm. but so let me just interrupt you for a second and just let's just do a bracket because there is, I, there is, I guess most people who are actually listening to this, they're not from the refrigeration. So let me just unpack that a little bit. What you said is great about the Montreal Protocol. It's not because people in the refrigeration industry was were bad it's basically because the chlorofluor how do you pronounce that the cnc chlorofluor CFC. yeah the cfc's those refrigerants they were actually awesome in terms of refrigeration systems so yeah. they're very compressible when, when they are changing phases so the main thing for our industry is how much heat they observe when they're changing phase and that's uh what is happening you know inside your fridge or in your car and that's where the thing they find out it's actually damaging the ozone layer no one knew about that in the 80s but then yep. they knew it's like okay now we got to change that usually that means okay let's find a fluid that is close enough you, it's really only working in the industry people who realize that but it's not just changing the fluid let's just change the fluid well now the pressures are different now sometimes you have a um a lubricant oil that is not compatible with that new refrigerant. So it's a, it's, it's a pretty ordeal. It's huge when you go to a massive yeah. refrigeration system and you're changing the, the, the fluid. So yeah, the first one was changing the CNC, the CFCs. And then now we're going to the ones to reduce the global warming potential. So yeah. now we are 
I guess the famous one now is one, two, three, four, ZE. Also, I forgot how is the refrigeration name, but propane also is becoming pretty common. Yeah, so it all depends on the applications. Like ammonia is still like the best best refrigerant out there, oh, yeah. but that one, awesome. that one, you know, it's it, they say it's toxic, but it, it's been around using for hundreds of years. They spray it on the fields, you know, for yeah. farmers' fields. Yeah. But the thing is, is that um, I've been noticing, and right now regulations is pushing for more natural refrigerants. So mm -hmm. CO2 refri uh, for as a refrigerant, propane as a refrigerant, and these refrigerants are they're natural, but there's some things that you need to be aware of them. Like the CO2 refrigeration, it is massive in Europe. There is tens of thousands of what we call transcritical booster systems globally hmm. uh, that uses CO2 on the high side as well as the low side. So the medium temp side and the low temp side. Mm -hmm. But what you need to understand about CO2, it runs at a higher pressure. So you have yeah. to have different valves. You have to have all electronics like pressure transducers and temperature probes. And you have to be aware that it just it's refrigerant every all of them are just refrigerant water is a refrigerant you know you just have to be aware of that you know those pressures now when you talk about propane propane is very flammable so now yeah. you have different rules and regulations that are coming into play with uh, when you talk about building codes and things like that so you really need to understand what you can and cannot use in those uh, applications because here in yeah. north america right now you only can use 150 grams or 5.2 ounces of propane in a a self-contained system for an example where in Europe it's a little bit different through the IEE I guess mm -hmm. and um, so ULs do going through UL process so as an engineer you need to start researching this stuff to make sure you're not left behind because yeah. we, I talk with the OEMs now and they're like well what's go, what's happening in the next three years well lots of things are happening mm -hmm. so here in Canada by 2025 you only can use a refrigerant for air conditioning of 750 GWP Ooh, so yeah. 750 a global warm potential where there's not many of those refrigerants out there there's more and more coming but when i started learning about this there was no refrigerants that were below the limits that they were were targeting for so now they're coming yeah. out with more more refrigerant as well as mm -hmm. for stationary refrigerant uh, refrigerant so uh, centralized racks it's 150 gwp in europe at the end of this year 2022 i believe it is so any mm. centralized yeah. rack you're going to be using co2 and huh. so one province in Canada, uh, in Quebec, they just passed that law back this year, this past January, where I only heard about it in the June. And all of a sudden, six months later, you can't build a new store without using something that's lower than 150 GWP. Well, and then it's different in the U.S. You got uh, uh -huh. uh, CARB, so California Air Resource Board, where they're mm -hmm. pushing just like the F-gas regulations, where by the end of the year, I think I think it's 2022, maybe not quote me on that, but any uh, refrigeration system, like new stationary system above 50 pounds has to be lower than 150 GWP. So there's a lot of stuff in, in the engineering side that you need to start thinking about now because yeah. these regulations, you don't want to just start building or designing your new equipment because designing equipment takes years. It doesn't yeah. happen overnight. you got to yeah. find the right compressors the valves the systems the controls the everything all the platforms so you if you're an engineering firm you should start looking into this now mm -hmm. and that's and why that's i really learned to, sorry go ahead yeah no this is crazy trevor i'm just wait, wondering like the people who were in the field because one thing is to work with 134a i guess the pressure i don't know might be i don't know 10 well, small pressure. atm on something like that so it's not it's not something that you would need a new let's say a new certification, but now CO2, we, we are talking something dangerous. You need to be probably, do you need a new certification to work with CO2? Well, there, it's, it's still refrigerate, uh, still refrigeration. Uh, what we're seeing, what I'm seeing, I do a lot of CO2 training. I have been mm -hmm. since the pandemic and it has slowed down a bit, but uh, mm -hmm. we, we do, I think last year, before the pandemic, we did 78 trainings here in Canada wow. with my team <laughs> on different things from industrial refrigeration, commercial refrigeration, HVAC, residential and in the control side uh, but what we're seeing is a lack of knowledge in the industry i even have buddies that have called me up before and they're working on co2 and the first time they've ever seen a system like wow. that and have to charge it and they're like how do i charge this trevor i i don't know you know <laughs> so there's a lack of knowledge because these regulations are changing so fast mm -hmm. and i see it because i'm at the manufacturer level so i have to know what everything's going on but when you go down two or three or four layers when you get down to that technician level they're mm -hmm. still working on those you know, 404, 507 systems, and they're just starting to 
do some retrofits to these newer gases because they're not going to have a, they don't have an option a lot mm-hmm. of the times. Uh-huh. And, um, and the prices just keep going up on certain refrigerants. So they need to start learning about this as well. So that's once again, that, that information needs to be passed along and the understanding of that information, because I really see, and I know we're going to need to start training more technicians in these mm-hmm. new refrigerants like propane, CO2, H2Ls, HFO refrigerants. Well, the way you're talking almost sounds to me like this is a great area to be working on because there's just so much to do. <laughs> yeah, it, it is fantastic. And that's what I love. One thing I love about Emerson, I th- if we're not the biggest refrigeration HVAC manufacturer of solutions and products, I don't know who else is because we have the compression for industrial, commercial, residential. We have the controls. We have the valves, the protectors, we have like it all. So what we do is we work with our OEMs to, to ha- have them develop the best package solutions. And mm-hmm. then on top of that, since the pandemic, we've developed teams. Emerson has developed, took people and developed teams to help our customers with the COVID pandemic because we build product where we can monitor like uh, labs, you know, scientific labs. We work with so many pharmaceutical companies trying to automate their processes to make um, you know, make vaccines quicker and faster and, and as well as make sure they make it to that end user at the right temperatures, you know, so we got mm-hmm. tracking device that will geolocate the thing to make sure that it stays at minus 70 or minus 20 or minus five. So when it gets to that hospital or that end user, they can look at the report that we know that this vaccine has stayed at that temperature traveling from the opposite side of the world. Mm-hmm. So it's mm-hmm. cool. It's a cool, cool place to work. That's for sure. Yeah. That's yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that. I was about to ask how he, how hard did COVID hit the refrigeration industry? I would assume quite the opposite. Actually, would have more demand because people are just staying at home and would, as you said, now the a, a good bunch of the of the vaccines need to be transported in a in a very low temperature and stuff like that. So I, I can't speak for the whole industry, but I know we were we're able to shift really really good because we have so many product lines. Mm-hmm. where we've seen a drop in a certain certain products, whatever it was, we got an increase in another side, which is great. But the refrigeration mm-hmm. industry in general, like all my buddies that are still mechanics, run companies, contractors, they're just, they are still wide open. Like they, I, th- I talked to one or two of them and they might've had last March, so a year ago, they might've had a one or two weeks where it was slow, uh, but the rest of it was, they're still, you still need that refrigeration. You need the hospital, uh, hospitals, air condition is still running. You need to have that comfort cooling. You need the food to be still going. You need the process plants to still be running. And yeah. this is just one division of Emerson, the, the one that mm-hmm. I work on. We still have a whole another automated solution division that works on so many cool things like uh, digital transformation solutions. Well, I just learned about one today because of the podcast, because uh, Emerson owns over 60 companies, I believe. Mm-hmm. And, um, one was called a digital twin, and I'm like, what's the digital twin? So it basically helps engineering companies. There's a software that does virtual simulations of, um, say, power grid companies, and it can help predict and make changes for those companies before they really do it to see if it's going to be an issue or if they should go ahead to uh, optimize their their company or that that's their, I guess, what they do. So yeah. I thought, I'm like, wow. I also learned that we have like $2.2 billion in software platform on our automated solution side that does everything from uh, controlling national power grids to building and microgrids and all these cool stuff from uh, pulp mills and offshore oil gases and uh, nuclear power plants. It's just like, we're, we're and, I, and I don't know much about that. So if anybody out there wants to learn more about that, get into the it's www.emerson.com and and just do some research. There's so much information on on the things that Emerson's trying to do to help change uh, change the world. So it's pretty cool. It's good to be involved in a company that that is looking out for others. I like that. That's really cool, man. And uh, well, it's clearly you're pretty passionate about it. Would you recommend to people that want to get into the HVAC industry and uh, and like your history and want to keep going? What what do okay. you recommend? Okay, that, that is a great question, Diego. So first off, wherever you're at in the world, um, and it all depends, like in Canada, it's real good because we do have uh, a system, like for a trade system, which is really good. 
here. Mm -hmm. So you have school, lots of schools here that are apprenticeship schools or trade schools where you can go. But if you're other place in the world, you don't have that those luxuries. So first, I would be reaching out to your local college or trade school. So get on Google and, and look for the closest refrigeration and HVAC school. From mm -hmm. there, if you don't have it, anything like that, research on where's the what, some of the best schools to go globally. Because mm -hmm. you can do that now, right? Yeah, yes, it costs a little true. bit more money to come to Canada, but Canada has great visas, student visas, where you can come and learn the refrigeration trade here. Mm -hmm. And if you, you don't have that opportunity, get online once again, reach out to some of these influencers, reach out to me, you know, on, on social media like LinkedIn or, or Facebook. And, and I try to give you at least the information I have, you know, mm -hmm. if that helps you where you're at, because around the world is different. Like in Brazil, I've got different power and different codes. Mm -hmm. And here in Canada is different than Europe and Australia. It's all, all different, but you can make it relate. That's why I say start locally and then branch out, out further because, when I first moved to Australia, we're talking bars and Celsius and I'm talking PSI and Fahrenheit. I'm like, what's going on here? Right. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's pretty cool. I guess people in the podcast don't know that, but uh, Trevor and I, and I, we talked before and realized we both lived in Perth and Western yeah. Australia. That was pretty cool. How long you, you stay there? I stayed uh, in Australia. I've been there a bunch of times, but I lived there for about a year. Cool. And, uh, Scarborough beach. That's where it was. I, I couldn't remember, but right on the beach there, Scarborough, that's where I stayed. Yeah. I was in Blaze, yeah. You ever went down to Margaret Weaver? Oh, yeah. I went and stayed down there for a few days with some friends right on the beach. And just I love out. that it was place. Awesome like, time. My wife hasn't been there yet, but I already told her, like, that's that's my plan to be there when I retire. That's that, that's it. Margaret Weaver, Western Australia. <laughs> yeah, that is fantastic. So, yeah, we've been to lots of places around Australia, which is great. The last place I was at before I came back working was in a place called Broom in northwestern Australia. Okay. Look it up. You've been there? Yeah. What else no, I've never been there, there, but it was my plan. But in, in the end, I, I was a student. I didn't have the money. I was just like, oh, man, I need to go back. I, I need to go there one day. It's it's pretty close to the um, to the Coral Barrier Reef, isn't it? Uh, Ningaloo Reef. Yeah. yeah. It's called Ningaloo Reef on Cape, Cape Range National Park, I think it was. Awesome. And, and I'm really – that's one thing I love about refrigeration. Uh, because when I strolled up the broom, me and my wife, we were mm -hmm. broke. No money for gas, nowhere, nowhere else to turn. And I actually got a job with a, a contractor within two days while I'm there because I'm a refrigeration mechanic. Within two <laughs> days, I was there. So that's why I say if you want to get a, a, a trade that you can use around the world, uh, get into the refrigeration industry. And that's, uh, that that's saved me. That's a great me. advice. That's a great yeah. advice. It's actually true. Yeah. It's something that you need everywhere in the world. And there's just so much work. So even if Canada and Europe, they're like, in the top fronts and changing fluids, that's going to roll down to everywhere in the world at some point. So this same work that you're just describing right now is just going to happen everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, no, so fun. Cool, man. And uh, I, I am mindful of time. I know you're a very busy guy. So any last thoughts and where people can reach you and where, where else they recommend to reach you and other podcasts that you participate and stuff like that? Uh, yeah, awesome. So yeah, anyone can reach out to me on my LinkedIn profile. So look me up, Trevor Matthews. Uh, I'm just, it'll say I'm from Emerson. Look me up on, on Facebook. I'm in a lot of different groups like uh, Supermarket Tech Talk and HVAC uh, group. Uh, check out a few influencers. Uh, Brian or HVAC School is one, one guy who's great, who loves giving knowledge out. He's out of the U.S., out of Florida. A guy in Canada, Gary McCready, is another guy. It's HVAC Know-It-All. Get onto his, their podcast. These guys are always delivering uh, information and trying to help the industry out. And there's many, many other ones that I deal with and work with. And I want to thank all those guys who want to work with me as well. But start reaching out to more people. The more people you network with within the industry, the better off you're going to be. Because that's mm -hmm. what I'm doing. I try to network as many people and see how we can help each other grow. So that's what some of my suggestions. That's really good, Trevor. Thank you. And I'll reach out to you to put all those links in the comments so people can reach out to you with awesome. stuff. So, yeah, thank you very much for taking the time, man. I really appreciate this. Thank you, Diego. Thanks again. Talk to you soon. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Hey, so this was a pretty interesting talk, right? I have the links in the description and in my website for the influencers that Trevor mentioned. 
and also for his LinkedIn profile. So I thought of just but adding some extra points here at the end. The damage caused by the CFCs was discovered by Sherry Rowland, Rowland and Mario Molina at 1974. And it turns out that the low reactivity of the CFCs, one of the things that make the um, CFCs, let's say, a good sponge, if you remember my analogy in the beginning, uh, is actually what is the most destructive effects. But just a very important point here for not being so quick in judging the technological options that we had in the past. According to the material safety data, CFCs and HCFCs, which are the already the next generation, they're colorless, volatile, non-toxic, non and they have a sweet ethereal odor. The overexposure of only above 11%, which is a lot, uh, start causing problems. Just to put into perspective, a different fluid, for instance, ammonia, which is a great refrigerant, is still in use for a lot of industrial applications nowadays, but it is really deadly. An exposure of 300 parts per million is already dangerous for life, for life and health and start being flammable of concentrations of 15%. So the reason CFCs were used is not because people in the past they were bad and they wanted the environment to screw it. No, it was a good solution for what we had at the time. We only realized was a problem later. So yeah, don't be so quick about judging the <laughs> solutions that we had in the past. Um, after a dramatic seasonal depletion, depletion in the ozone layer in Antarctica, during the 80s, finally was signed the Montreal Protocol that we talked in the podcast. A fun fact here that Mario Molina, also with Paul Crutzen and F. Sherwood Rowland, they won jointly the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1995 for, and I open quotes here, for the work in atmospheric chemistry, particularly concerning the formation and the composition of ozone. And uh, I, I thought this was specifically... Uh, relevant because uh, Mario Molina just died a couple months ago in October at the age of 77. He was not just a great scientist, but he was really big into advocating uh, the science behind it and showing the industry and the people understanding why it was important to ban the CFCs. So this is how it is done. You teach people what to do and how we move forward. <laughs> Um, we then went to the second generation of fluid refrigerants, the HFCs, and mainly because they're really similar to the CFCs and it was easy to just change, relatively changing the fluids, right? But then we start com uh, concerning for something else that is the global warming potential. So basically the GWP that we also talked in the podcast is a measure of how much energy the emissions of one ton of gas will absorb over a given period relative to the emission of one ton of carbon dioxide. So again, for perspective, uh, car carbon dioxide is actually, I know it's the one that we talk a lot, but actually the GWP of CO2 is very low. Um, and to put in perspective, if you see any video of um, a refinery or some, the places that they get oil, you know, petro petroleum out of, uh, out of the ground, you see there is a, a flame in the top, they call it flare. The, that is because when you're doing this process, you actually emitting a lot of methane and the global warming potential of methane is much higher than CO2. So they literally are burning methane, what we use as natural gas, uh, in order to, because that's better for the environment than releasing um, methane. So again, we need to put everything in perspective, the solutions that we use. Um, so this third and fourth generation are now fluids that are organic and basically they have a low global warming potential and they have nothing to do with the ozone layer. And the big challenge is now is that these refrigerants, they are so different from the original ones that there is no dropping solution. So basically a lot of the systems we need to redesign because the, you know, the compatibility of the refrigerant with oils, you know, the lubricant oils of the compressors or the, um, uh, the density 
of these fluids are so different that you just cannot use the same compressors in the same system. So it is a big area for sure. As, uh, as Trevor said, there is a lot to unpack there. There is a lot to work in this industry. And uh, yeah, it can be really, really interesting and really fun to work with all of that. So I guess this is it for this episode. I don't have a lot of housekeeping other than thank you very much for the support. I, if you made out the way to here, thank you so much. Please keep the feedbacks, critics, and comments coming. And I really appreciate all of them. So see, we next, see you next week. Bye-bye.